Hello, welcome. Welcome everyone. I'm just gonna give it a moment to let everyone get logged in. Thank you so much for being here today. If you are just logging in now, if you wanna drop in the chat where you're tuning in from, we always love to see that, see where, where everyone is. Just give it a moment to make sure everyone's has a chance to get logged in. Oh, hello from Boston. Hello from New Village. Hello from Seattle, Maryland, Andover, Massachusetts, St. Louis, Victoria, BC. Oh, wow. There's too many to read off, but yay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're very excited. Um, we've got a really wonderful talk for you. So give it just another second and see if more folks are streaming in. Okay. Fantastic. All right, that's tapering off a bit. So we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are here to discuss this beautiful book, Gateau with Alexandra Crepanzano and of course, David Leibovitz. And we're very excited to have both of them here. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Zoe Friesen. I'm the events manager here at Book Larder. And as you can imagine, we've been doing a lot of these virtual events over the past couple of years. And we are, um, we have been able to start doing some more in-person events now, which is wonderful, but we still really love doing these virtual events. It gives us a chance to connect with authors and interviewers from all over as our two folks joining us today from France, which is so exciting. Um, and also to connect with, uh, with viewers and with our audience that's all over, which is amazing. Um, someone just asked in the chat, so I'll go ahead and say it now. This will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you're not able to catch the whole thing or if you wanna rewatch it or share it, um, it will be up um, It'll be up on our YouTube channel within a day or two. And I will also be emailing out that link to everyone that was on the Zoom so that you will be in the know on that. Um, okay, let's see what else. I do have the live transcription turned on today. So um, if you want that turned on or turned off, uh, you can do that at the bottom of your screen under the three dots of more. You can control that if you wanna see that. And then let's see, um, yes, okay. Just checking my notes here. All right. Well, we are uh, very excited and we will be also, um, Alexandra and David will also be answering some of your questions a little bit later on in the hour. So they're gonna chat for a bit and then they'll answer questions. So I do ask that you go ahead and put those questions into um, the Q&A box. So you can go ahead and use the chat to chat with each other, chat with me. Um, but for questions for Alexandra and David, please put those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And um, that's where David will see your questions and, and get a chance to get those answered. And let's see. What else do we need to cover? Okay, um, also this is of course a free event, but you can support this talk by purchasing a copy of Gateau from our shop. And I will drop the link in the chat for that. And uh, we do, we, we will be having book plates coming from Alexandra in the next couple of days. We don't have them just yet, but we will be having them soon. We will get them in soon. So if you want to wait for a book plate signed copy, just make sure you leave a note in your order and we will make sure that um, you go ahead and get a, a signed copy of the book. Um, and thank you to everyone that's already purchased. And if you wanted to grab a book plate from us also, just let us know. Um, you can email info at booklarder.com and I'll drop that in the chat as well. Okay, enough of my housekeeping. I think we are ready to go. So please welcome Alexandra and David. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello, Alexandra. Hi. I just immediately before you even start say thank you because oh. David is uh it's nine o'clock in Paris and uh, nine oh six you have to be exact here if you remember nine oh six he's had a really long day uh and uh getting his kitchen renovated and had to eat early because of us and he's awesome and I'm a huge 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 fan of his so oh. huge so well, I'm a fan of yours, um, but I'm also a fan of Book Larder Bookstore. Just to um, start with that, um, I, I, when I was on book tour, I didn't know about Book Larder. This is years ago. And I walked in, and it's a truly special place. Um, the people are wonderful. 
the quantity of books they carry. Um, and they're just terrific people. Um, I love everything about it. The only thing is it's hard to do events there because I want to look at all the books on the shelves. Um, so if you're watching and you want a copy of Alexandra's book, there are going to be book plate signed copies. And when you order your book um, through Book Larder, through the link, um, just say you want a book, book plate signed copy. Um, I've been speaking French all day, so I might screw up my English. So <laughs> much apologies, but it's a wonderful book. Um, I actually um, am jealous because I wish I wrote it myself. Um, I would love to steal it because it's a great idea. I'm like, why didn't I think of this? But I wouldn't have done as good of a job as Alexandra. So um, it's great to meet you. We've never actually met in person, but I think I met you virtually or maybe you had written two books and they were about unobvious subjects. The first one that I knew was the London um, book the, about food in London. And then the second one was about Los Angeles, the cuisine of Los Angeles. And nobody talks about those, or at least they didn't talk about those subjects. And I was like, who is this person that wrote these amazing books about, uh, first of all, London, and you don't live in London. Um, and you wrote the great, you know, it's like people want to come to Paris and write a book. You, you have to live here, I think, you, to do it justice. And same with LA. So you wrote this book, Gateau, and you actually lived in Paris. Can you tell us a little bit about your connection to Paris? Because I'm fascinated. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So um, I had a, I had a crazy childhood. My mother's a journalist. My father is a professor of anthropology and comparative literature. And so through my mother, I spent an enormous amount of time in Europe, even, you know, from seven months on. And my father had actually um, been educated in Europe. And, um, and when I was following my father around doing, doing what he was doing, I wasn't doing, he was doing his field work. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, in Africa as well. So I, I really, I started traveling when I was, when I was seven months old, really, really early. And uh, wow. my mother was the, was a European correspondent for the New Yorker. And so she was kind of uh, going back and forth and back and forth between New York and Paris or London uh, when I was really little. And, uh, and at a certain point really wanted to, to kind of dive in full on. And my father had always wanted to, to go back and live in Europe. And this was in the age of kind of literary theory. So he was teaching with Derrida and, you know, writing in cafes and everybody was incredibly um, happy to be there. And they ended up being there for 16, for 16 years. So I moved when I was 10 and then I um, was there for middle school. And then I was, um, I mean, I came back eventually to finish high school and, and go to college. In, in, in America. America. Yeah. Yeah, because okay. I have friends who are American who have lived here quite a long time, and they educate their kids in France for like elementary school and high school, and then they want to send them to college in the United States. They go, well, they're getting a really good education in like history and the basics, but then they go to America to learn to be open and creative, because um, those things don't necessarily they don't teach those things. And I mean, you have more experience. I didn't go to school in France except pastry school. So, oh, well, that, which is great. I have to say, the, the French are, there's not a lot of positive reinforcement in the classroom. Every, everything is kind of pas mal, you know, not, not bad. Um, so, and there's a lot of memorization. But, it, but the education there really taught me to be a writer because they, they actually have you kind of, um, as you're taking notes, you're actually supposed to take notes in the way that the teacher has constructed her or his um, classroom lesson. So it's it's almost like you're seeing the structure. Um, well, I was on a live panel once in Paris and I was talking to the other panelists and I said, well, afterwards, let's do questions and answers. And this woman next to me is French. She goes, oh no. She goes, no one in France will raise their hand because they're if they do in school and they get the answer wrong, they get like yelled at. <laughs> so, oh, yes, no, no, it's, we're a laughing stock, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But uh, but I loved it and I loved, uh, you know, coming from New York, which, you know, was, has you know, sometimes is safer than not, but is never a really safe city for a, a young kid um, to, to at least to have the kind of independence I wanted. When I got to Paris, which was so safe, and I had this enormous dog from Normandy, Romeo, who was 125 pounds, 
And the two of us could just, you know, take off mm. after school and walk through the city. Uh, and it was so it was, it was a great time of kind of feeling independent and exploring. And I could bring him into all of the different shops, which was great. Right. And they love dogs. They're like, oh, say, say adorable. Exactly. But well, it's a good segue to um, just um, speaking of questions and answers, we will not humiliate anybody who asks a question. So if you do have a question, um, yes. feel free to use the Q&A. Don't put it in the chat, but put it in the Q&A and we'll get to those later. But one thing you mentioned in your book, so your book, um, Gato, is divided into chapters. And I really, I was studying it today when they were installing my kitchen and they were, excuse me, can we bother you? I was like, no, but I, it was very, um, the first chapter of the book is about yogurt cakes. And to an American, it might sound a little weird, but can you explain the importance? What is a yogurt cake and what is the importance of it? And I also have to say, I counted the variations you gave and I think there was 52. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> it is endlessly adaptable. So um, so as, as you know, David, in, in Maternal, which is I, kind of between nursery and kindergarten, really, um, French kids are actually taught in school how to make a yogurt cake. And it is so easy because you, this is actually an espresso cup, but you basically, yogurt comes in a little kind of roughly half cup uh, it's either usually glass or ceramic little jar and you actually use that to measure all of the ingredients so what you'll see in a kindergarten if you look through the windows is you'll see kids who um there's it's adorable they'll have a bowl and one whisk exactly and one and one yogurt um and uh, and their ingredients and they'll dump the yogurt into the bowl and then they will use that yogurt jar to measure the other ingredients so they don't need to already know numbers or how to read or anything else. They just know that, you know, you take one of the yogurt and then you you dump that and you measure that for flour, sugar, and oil. Yeah. So it's super easy. And, you know, but then, and it's such a great recipe and it's, I think it's iconic in the way that for us, you know, Toll House chocolate chip cookies are, right? You learn those really, really early. You never tire of them. You bake them through your life. And, you know, and usually you start to shift things around according to your taste at a certain point, adding more of this or more of that or whatever it is you want. So the yogurt cake really is that recipe that you get, you, you learn, it's in your back pocket, you know it, you can do it anywhere. Um, and well, it's, it's great when you go to people's house on the wheat, like people have, so everybody in France has like a maison, maison secondaire and second home. Yes. Even if they're like, they're not rich, they have a second house. I don't, I don't know how they do it, but they don't have anything in their kitchen to cook with. Like they have a bad knife. They, they have like one cutting board. You know. So it's great to have this yogurt cake and everyone loves yogurt cake and you don't need any special equipment. But it's funny to me because um, people in Europe or, or around everywhere and every other country in the world, they complain about American measurements. They're like, everything should be weighed. But I'm like, well, the yogurt cake is not weighed. It's all volumes. That's true. That's true. And also, you know, um, you know, the other recipe that's actually that's in that first chapter that I think is is almost as iconic, but probably not, but is their version of a pound cake in which they actually do weigh. Um, you know, they would always start by weighing the eggs because you never knew how many eggs you might get. Uh, mm -hmm. And you would use that measurement then to do the flour and the sugar. Um, and and what I love about that recipe, also incredibly, incredibly easy, is that you're, you're really eliminating the possibility of forming gluten and having a tough cake because you're coating, you're coating the flour and melted butter so early in the process that it's, again, it is like, these are ahatable, which means foolproof. They're recipes that you can do when you're, when you are a kid, because you can, you can over mix because you're never going to make it, you're never going to make it tough, which is great. Well, people call um, pound cake or cat cat uh, gâteau weekend also in France, which you refer to in your book as well, because they say it keeps well over the weekend. Exactly. Um, and, uh, and, and I love that, you know, I also love how seriously the French take weekends, right? I mean, in, in America, <laughs> most of us do work all weekend, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. in one way or the other, but the French really do have their weekends. Yeah. And as you said, they like to go to the, to another house. So they will actually, they'll sometimes they will bake a weekend cake can also mean kind of two cakes, kind of one for now and one for the weekend because those cakes tend to keep well. And they've also adopted the word, not only weekend, but also cake. So, but a cake, 
Hex. <laughs> it actually is. It is called a weekend cake, but uh, but cake refers to almost anything in a in a loaf shape. And okay. um, from at least my understanding, you might disagree. Um, and uh, and the weekend cakes are sturdy enough that you can kind of you can bring them on the train on a plane, yeah. put them in a lunchbox, you know, put them in a beach. Well, table. one thing people don't understand about France often is that they're not home bakers, French people. And there is actually isn't a word for home baker. Like we say home baker, I'm a home baker. And also there's no word for custard. Maybe you know the word. <laughs> I do not know the word for custard. Yeah, so. it's like there's no global, someone said liaison. Maybe I'm like, well, that doesn't really work. But anyway, I, I'm, I, I've been living here for 20 years. And I'm trying to find the answer to that question. <laughs> so if anybody knows, put the answer in the Q&A. Um, but one thing you talked about also in the book, and I always find this very interesting, is that the French don't automatically add vanilla to everything, mm -hmm. um, which we do. And I love vanilla. And the same with cinnamon. Um, yeah. I recently, I, last weekend I made, well, last week I made a French apple cake, which is just apples and a batter. And everybody always says in America, can we add cinnamon? I'm like, no, because it's French. And because they like the flavor of apples, but you talk about vanilla um, in the pound cake recipe and you do I, add vanilla. I do, but, but, well, let me get back to the, to the first thing you mentioned too, about there not being home bakers and there being no word for that. Cause I actually realized there was actually also no book about ghetto because it's kind of assumed that everybody just does it and knows how to do those basic ones. So they don't, yeah. they don't kind of um, shine a spotlight on it, even though it's so yeah. good. Um, so vanilla, I'm so glad about, you mentioned the apple and the vanilla. So my sense, and, and tell me what you think, but my sense about the way that the French cook, and this is true, whether it's savory or sweet, is that they are really trying to spotlight whatever that main ingredient is that they're trying, that they, that they want you to appreciate, right? So if, if it's strawberry, they want you to taste strawberry. If it's hazelnut, they want you to taste hazelnut. And so if you eat something, if you take a bite of something super sweet, your first sensory experience is gonna be sugar. It's gonna be, oh wow, sweet. And, and I think what the French really want you to do is taste, you know, taste apple or taste chocolate or taste, you know, whatever it is that butter. is the, your cake. And, and so the nuance is there and, um, and the balance I think skews more towards other flavor than it does towards sugar. Um, and, you know, and likewise, they don't, you know, they don't tend to ice their cakes when they make cakes at home. They might do a little bit of glaze or a soaking syrup. But I have, I have French friends who come to New York and they'll order cake because of course they order cake at dessert. Yeah. But then they will literally kind of scrape the icing off <laughs> because <laughs> it's just too much. Um, what and, do they do with black and white cookies? That's the whole thing, <laughs> the icing. Exactly. And then, uh, you know, and then with, you know, with vanilla, I realized that, you know, the more I, the more I cook, the more I like to take away, the more I eliminate things that I, you know, and, and my cooking becomes, I think, both baking and savory becomes more, a little more spare, a um, mm. little bit more ingredient focused. And I think that's in some ways a sign of confidence because it's, it's recognizing that you know what to do with food, which I think when I was obviously younger, I didn't in the same way. But, um, but as, soon as, you, as soon as you start to question why you're adding things, like why am I adding vanilla to a chocolate cake? Do I want it to taste like vanilla? You know, you kind of realize, well, maybe actually I don't, maybe I just want that pure chocolate. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't want it I don't want anything interfering with that. Um, so I, so my, you know, I guess my my request of of my readers in this book, I hope all of you, um, is is not to just reach for vanilla and not to just reach for cinnamon when you're cooking with apples, because if you don't, as David said, sometimes you get this incredible appley taste that you might not, that might otherwise be masked. The French do, however, use a ton of rum. And I am talking to the right person. David wrote the great book on French cocktails. So he is not at all surprised by the long list of liquors in the yeah. book. I have liquor everywhere around. <laughs> One thing interesting do. about, oh, well, thank you. One thing interesting though about vanilla in France or maybe in Europe is that it's considered a flavor. So when you're gonna make like Madeleines, they're like, oh, you're gonna make vanilla. If you're gonna add vanilla, you call them vanilla Madeleines. 
Um, they don't necessarily, it's not the default to add um, vanilla, but just go, we'll go down this vanilla thing, just very interesting. Because in America, vanilla extract has alcohol in it. And I and it enhances the flavor. And I was talking to Harold McGee, who writes about food science, and he goes, well, that's because alcohol changes the way you taste things. And even if it's baked out, um, he goes, that's why, because I always use vanilla bean and vanilla extract. In France, they often just use the bean. And to me, it's not enough. And he goes, that's because you, it changes your perception. So. Oh, that's I, fascinating. Yeah, I bring my own vanilla extract over from, from America. Or you can just add a little rum too. Yeah, but I get vanilla extract. This is a woman, really great woman, Patricia Rain in Santa Cruz, who I've been buying vanilla from for 40 years. And um, I just love her. But, but I love your book. Um, and I was also really researching it today because when I made the Madelines last week, one thing I one thing that's a genius thing about this book is that, and I just realized this, is that most of these things you have, you have the ingredients in your pantry. Like when I made the chocolate Madelines, I didn't have to go shopping. It's, you know, French baking is not, home baking is very simple. You know, anybody, like anybody watching this probably has the ingredients to make dough. You can make a pound cake with what you have in your pantry. Um, but you also have holiday cakes. Um, you have this great chapter on Bouche de Noël. And yes. I'm going to let you talk about that in just a second. But people often ask me, you know, oh, when people, French people make Bouche de Noël, it's like they know they can't compete with Pierre Hermé. So they don't try to make a fancy cake. So tell us a little bit about the Bouche de Noël um, and also some of the other holiday cakes. And then we're going to talk about financier. Okay. how I attacked online. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so I would say you're absolutely right about Bouche de Noël. I mean, in France, in Paris at least, and, and I remember, I still remember as a kid, kind of come the beginning of December, that there would, ooh, chocolate, uh, that there would be this, you know, suddenly the windows of the great patisserie, um, patisseries uh, in Paris would uh, have these incredible displays of what their Bouche de Noël was going to be. So it was almost a kind of announcement that the patissiers would make. And, um, and I always had a favorite. I always loved mocha because I felt that the coffee was incredibly um, sophisticated and grown up when I was a child. Uh, but I also loved chestnut and I loved pear. And there were so many that I loved, but we always did buy them. But if you actually do leave a city and you go out into the country, people do make them. And I wanted people here to be able to make them. And I, you know, what, when you actually kind of deconstruct what a bouche noel is, it is really simply a sponge cake, a, a genoise that is made in a sheet pan and, and filled and rolled and, um, and covered usually with ganache. And you take a fork right to that ganache and make it look like a log and, uh, and you're basically done. So it actually, it's one of those recipes that looks incredibly complex, but is in fact incredibly easy. And I wanted people to be able to do that. But I also, you know, one of the things that is happening, I think, in Paris even more now, and, and, and David would be the expert on this, but is that France is really opening its kind of culinary borders, I think, a little bit more than ever. Um, so that there's always been a lot of rose water and there's, I mean, there've been a lot of Middle Eastern flavors. There's been a lot of orange blossom water. There's obviously the connection with Morocco and all of, all of the Mediterranean. So Ras al Hanout and, and other North African spice mixes. But, um, but there's, there's more of a Japanese influence right now in Paris as well. And so people are starting, you're starting to see yuzu um, in Bouche Noël, which I love. So I wanted to, I wanted to include that. It's one of the most beautiful recipes. And um, you know, and the French are very ritualistic, right? So they will only have a bouche de Noël at Christmas. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. but you can have it any time of the year, as long as you don't make it look like a bouche de Noël, I think. You can, right. you can just, say it's a roulade. Right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, it's like you have a recipe in your book also for a galette de roi, which is yeah. a, a famous cake in France. It's puff pastry for people that don't know it, um, around with uh, pastry cream, French Japan inside. And you have a chocolate so one. Um, and that would raise, people go, oh, oh. Mm. Uh, yeah, that American is, is breaking with tradition. Yeah. Dare and then they'll eat it. Um, <laughs> you have a, actually one of the best lines in the book, and I forgot what recipe it's in, but 
you, your head notes are great. I could tell you love writing head notes. Um, and that's what makes the book extra great because you can get into bed and read it. And it's funny and it's fun. And you really understand France because you lived here um, mm -hmm. for so long. And you, when you speak French, you start to understand the culture better because sure. it's hard to understand until you start speaking French and all the little words and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned like in the summer when the Parisians go on vacation, yeah. They allow themselves to have cocktails and rosé, and then they go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know I. Finicky. I you said finicky, I think. Yes, you know, but I love, I love, for example, seeing the French drink tequila because you know they treat it as you know as they would another good liquor or spirit, and so they will, you know, they will really taste it, and they'll have a little, you know, a, a little glass of it, and they'll have a little something. I think that section was. Um, I, uh, I, I did this recipe in the book for hot honey madeleine, which mm -hmm. is a really, really fun recipe because oh, I, I, you know, madeleine are, are, you know, often have honey, right? And I, I thought, why not actually make a chili infused honey and do uh, a madeleine that has that hot honey in it? And then I thought, you know what, let me just add some tequila. Um, and then I thought, you know what, okay, this would be a great thing to have if you are, you know, if you're down south on vacation, basically. But, uh, but it's, it's wonderful. And I think the French, they, they do, um, they really, when they, when they take a vacation or a weekend, or it's a holiday, they do, they let loose, they completely right. let loose and, and all of the kind of the formality that you sometimes see the rest of the year, or the rest of the week really does diminish. Uh, and anyway, but but back to that galette, I have to say it it also has usually a little a little fev, a little um, something inside of it, whether it's a it used to be a bean, but now sometimes it's like a little unicorn or a little crown or something. And if you are a kid and you get the slice with that, you get to be king or queen for the day in your family. And so everybody tries to get that particular piece. And I still remember when I got that piece. <laughs> it's like a, you know, it's been about 12 or 13. And, uh, and you know, like, it's one of those memories. Like all the cakes in your book, though, you made them really easy to make. Like I was surprised you did a guest post for my um, newsletter, just some of my newsletters at davidlibovitz.substack.com. Um, but it was a daquoise, a chocolate daquoise, which sounds really fancy. It was um, your mother used to take the Concorde to Europe. And I need to find out that her secret in case they bring it back because she got to fly it for economy class. Did she take you on it too? No, no, I was always in school. I never got to go on it, but uh, but she loved she loved that chat. And I have to tell everybody, David's newsletter is an absolute must. Um, not only if you're just a francophile, but but for the the recipes and the food and the information and um, and the narrative. Even though I don't I don't put apples and cinnamon, but I do like <laughs> cinnamon. I'm not, I'm not that French yet. I still use cinnamon. But one of my favorite chapters is the Madeleine. Madeleine Financier et, and Visitandine. And I can't even pronounce that word. And I yeah. actually don't know what it is. You I didn't know what, know what it was. It's another one of those little almond cakes. So, the, you know, one thing I think is, is true. A lot of people are asking me these days, you know, are there gluten-free recipes in the book? And there absolutely are. And the reason is, is simply because the French actually use a lot of nut flours and they've been using nut flour long before I think we started using almond flour in the same way that we are now. I think we Americans started using nut flours kind of with the awareness of gluten intolerance. Um, the French have actually been doing it, I think, more to keep their cakes moist and to give that extra little bit of texture for a long time. Um, but there are all of these wonderful recipes that are connected. And, um, you know, we don't think of financier and Madeleine and things like that as actually being cakes, but they are considered little cakes, which is why I put them in the book. But um, but they are, you know, they they really have, as you know, they have a lot of egg whites and they have a lot of nut flour and they stay moist and they're very tender and they're very delicate and delicious. And again, they're also adaptable in that you can, you can just toss a raspberry into the batter when you're making it, you can toss, you can change nuts around and do one with pistachios. Dory Greenspan, I think in her newsletter yesterday did a great one with pistachios. Uh, you can do them with hazelnuts. You can, I've never tried them with pine nuts, which aren't really a, a nut, but you can, you can really play with them. And you can also, you can add liqueurs, you can add chocolate chips if you want, you can add dried cherries, you can add so many different things. So they are, again, 
enormously adaptable, which I, which is what I love. But the other thing I just want to say about Madeleine is there's a this incredible misconception that they are difficult to make, and I think uh -huh. the reason they couldn't be easier, and they are they're the best thing to make if you want to create serious wow factor because. You make the batter six hours in advance or 24 hours in advance. You put it in a madeleine pan or you just put it in the fridge. And literally, as you were serving dinner, you preheat the oven. When you're about 10 minutes from dessert, you pop them in the oven and you take them out. And people get completely quiet when they taste a madeleine that is just from the oven because it, it is, it's an extraordinary thing. And, um, and again, like, like all of these recipes and, and really the way the French cook at home, it is, it's not overly fussy. It's not overly fancy. It's not decorated. Usually yeah. the French rarely will decorate food at home. They might plate it well, but they're not going to, um, to go to elaborate. Well, also, people don't like people are thrilled when they go to someone's house for dinner. If somebody made a dessert, even if it looks terrible, like if the sides fell or if it's burnt, whatever, they're thrilled. And they're so happy that they're very appreciative of a homemade dessert. And people offer, you know, things like Madeleine's, people online would be like, why isn't there a hump? And why is this and this? And, or I'm like, mine didn't hump. I'm like, you know what? In France, like nobody at home, like a home cook wouldn't care that much about it. Um, during the macaroon craze, people kept asking me, well, when French people make their macaroons, I'm like, well, nobody would make macaroons at home. It's just exactly. something you buy, you know, and it's because right. they're fussy. But like you mentioned, French baking, you know, in your book, you know, the subtitle of your book is the surprising simplicity of French cakes. Mm -hmm. And that's because they really do bake simply. They don't, it's not about wowing your guests. It's about feeding your, you know, having a nice experience. And I think they also really do have a, um, a great attachment to history in food. Um, which I like, so that there's, they're not trying necessarily to rewrite or to reinvent the wheel. They are, they tend to really want to stick to the beloved classics and what they know well, and then to riff on them. But I do, I do appreciate that because if you're, if you're cooking for a dinner party, then, um, and you've got people over, you are, you're cooking, you're cooking simply, you're cooking in a way that you know how to do, it's less stressful. Um, people feel well fed. You're cooking with quality ingredients, and you know. And um, so, I just hi. <laughs> so somebody heard we were talking about food, and French people love to talk about food. <laughs> <laughs> hi there. So this is Ale Ale Alexandre. Enchanté. Enchanté is Roman, my partner. But I wanted to ask him how to print because I'm I don't want to embarrass myself on live Zoom. But how do you pronounce that in French? Mm -hmm. Comment tu dis ça en français? Vi, uh, visitandine. Visitandine. How's that sound? How do you say it? That's exactly how I say it. I mean, it's it's that's a rare recipe. I have to go back and find that. But I think, doesn't that date back hundreds of years? I think that's one of the ones that dates back hundreds of years. And that's why I included it, because I love that. And it's good. Yeah, it dates back to the 17th century and, um, and comes from the of Western France. So I, I get totally, I'm a, I'm a history nerd. So I, I love, um, I love connecting these recipes to their origins. And, you know, and obviously we have convection ovens and stand mixers and baking powder and all of those things. But there, but I, but so many of these recipes, like the Les Nonettes have been around, you know, that has been around since. I love the those. And you got the recipe from the Alan Ducas website. And I just have to say, a lot of times recipes don't work on websites. And I was like, I want to make those. I, tell us about no nets because they're like actually something that people don't know about and they're so good. You know, I, I think they're they're almost to me, they're almost like little spice cakes, but they're but they're moist, right? So so the way that, um, that the French have a, you know, they have pain d'épice, which is a, a spice cake that they make around the holidays. It it's kind of like an American gingerbread in a way. Yeah, in but way. Usually, usually harder, I think. And I mean, as in literally harder. And okay. it's kind of, it's meant to last. It's almost like a, like a English pudding that way. Um, and, and I like those, but I actually have a recipe for a moist one, which I really, really love. And the visitadine is to me is, oh, sorry, the, the nonettes are, um, 
have that that incredible spice to them and they're almost you kind of pop them into your mouth but they are from they were they originated in a convent but a particular order of nuns that i think were less into deprivation than others <laughs> so, okay. so 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 it obviously the, the name actually refers to uh to nuns and to convents well, I've heard two different theories of how financier got their name is one is because of the shape it resembles a bar of gold. And the second one is that people who work in finance wear suits and uh, uh, dresses or whatever people dress, dress nice. I don't know what the proper uh, terms for what people wear nowadays are called, but in French, you just say costume and that covers everything. Yes. Um, that's like that's when French comes in, um, but it was so they don't get messy. They could eat a pastry and not get. Which theory is right? Oh, I think I do feel like it was because it's you know they originated so close to the Bourse, which is the the stock exchange in France in Paris, um, and so all of these bakers would walk down the street. Uh, bankers would walk down the street, and I think I think the idea was very much that if they loved money, that maybe if you if you created something that looked like it was a brick of gold, uh, you would catch their eye and they would come in and try it. So that was that's always been my theory for that is that uh, you know it has a it has a slight golden hue to it and it and it looks ah, bold they've added a third theory I know, I the third one i know oh dear <laughs> mind blown okay. but but so good and you can make those you know I'll, if i'm at somebody's house and i don't have my tin i'll just make them in you know little muffin tins or mini muffin tins or you know even those little mini bunt um uh, i was pants. yeah, yeah. Well, that was when I was attacked online because um, I have a recipe for financier and I say to use mini muffin tins because traditionally they're baked, as you know, um, in little rectangular metal tins and nobody has that. I mean, if you tell someone in America to buy those, um, you know, they're nice to have, but not everybody has them. But these, somebody went off on me online saying that's not a financier, it's round. I was like, well, when I went to, I went to a Cole Note, we made them round. Oh, yeah. um, Eric Kaiser makes them round. A lot of bakeries make them round. Um, and these people that. arguing with me, I'm like, well, do you want to argue with like Pierre Hermé? And, you know, and then everyone started piling in about it. It's like, <laughs> it's like well, oh my God. Is you can now, which I love, is you can you can get those little silicon trays too, which are great. And so, for example, with, I think just in terms of, of ease for some of those, you don't get the same um, crust as you do with the metal tin, but they're nice and easy. Yeah, I, I have a thing about silicon molds. I just don't like them. And um, you have wonderful people that wrote reviews um, for the back of your book. Um, and one of my heroes and a good friend of mine, Nancy Silverton, she also, she's like, I don't like silicone either, um, but it's amazing. She wrote, like, I would, I'm scared to, and she's a friend of mine. I'm scared to ask her for a quote because my book is <laughs> she's Nancy. She's so in awe of her. She's really nice. She's great. We have great quotes from Apollonia Poilin, uh, Nancy Silverton, Amanda Hesser, and um, Dory Greenspan. But before we get to the questions and answers, um, if anyone has a, the definitive answer to financier, we're willing to entertain. We don't need a fourth theory. We've got, I, we, I started this with two, three is my maximum. But we talked a little bit about savory cakes and you have a whole chapter on savory cakes. And to an American, it probably sounds a little weird. I love savory cakes. I think, I think savory cakes actually saved me during the pandemic. Oh. Because like like so many mothers, I was not used to making lunch, <laughs> and lunch was a problem, right? When you're when you're busy and you're working and and you know you've got everything going on, and um, but now I just I I will always continue to make them and I'd made them before, but they're they are they're the equivalent almost of a quick bread, right? They're a cake, they're a loaf, but they have no sugar in them, and they are everything that you want in a sandwich put into the batter and baked. And um, and so you can, like I do a croque monsieur one, which is basically, you know, uh, ham and some gruyere and I add some, you know, you can add some leeks or some scallions or you can add whatever. And my friend, uh, Melissa Clark taught me that you can use buttermilk um, instead of creme fraiche, which is great. 
Um, oh, wow. as, I know, don't, don't tell. But as long as you're using the, the real kind of whole full fat, you know, yeah. artisanal one, because otherwise it's too thin and kind of watery. But I love that because basically you're creating a sandwich in one loaf that stays moist for, you know, three days, that's incredibly transportable. And what I always hate about sandwiches and lunch boxes and things is that either, you know, you have an ice pack, so they, their texture is ruined and one side is too cold and the other isn't, or you, or you put them in the fridge and the bread gets dry or you leave them out and they get soggy. I mean, there's sandwiches are really tough for lunch boxes, I think. And um, and if you just do a, a slice of this in a lunchbox, you're golden. It can you know it can travel. It'll stay fresh. It's wonderful. Don't need to refrigerate it. You can. It's also you know the French are so they're frugal. They're practical. I think one of the reasons that they can eat well every single day is that they actually are frugal and practical. Um, uh -huh. And and so you know they will. You can add whatever cheeses you have in the house. But but basically you can you can make a a savory cake and you can cut it into thick slices and then cut it into squares and it's great with a glass of wine before dinner. But it's also great for lunch with a salad. It's also great for late dinner after the movies with a salad. It's great again to take on a picnic lunch box. Any of those things. And even by day three, you can toast it and just drizzle it with an ol a little olive oil. My favorite one, though, I just have to say because I, you know, I this is very, very much a French book, but I do, uh, I, you know, I do appreciate the Mediterranean and and Italy, and they make a uh, caprese version, which is essentially cherry tomatoes and mozzarella and basil and olive oil. And it is so good because it's like, it's like that last bite of a caprese salad where you want to take that last bit of bread and kind of run it across the plate. So you get a little of the olive oil and a little of the tomato juice. You kind of get everything in one. So I love savory. Well, the great, well, the great thing about the savory cakes, first of all, I think you posted on Instagram. You're like, I made the croque monsieur cake. And I was like, Okay, once again, this is why I didn't write the book is because you thought of that. I was like, why didn't I think of that? That's brilliant. Because the croque monsieur is like the best sandwich in the world. Um, I, I could eat that every day for lunch um, or for oh, dinner. Yeah, um, but you made a cake out of it. And they, you know, one of my frequently asked questions, people always want to make things in advance. They're having parties. And these cakes are perfect. And you, how do you, put, will you speak French a little bit? Because I had Romain come. Cake. Oh, le cake salé. Right. I mean, it's just, which just means, I mean, kind of salted or savory, but it's um, for salé. But you would, but, uh, you know, uh, you can, you can, what I love about them is you can add anything. I think I have one, I like to add chorizo um, yeah. to them. Also. Anything strong is good. Well, one thing funny about, about learning French is like you say, the cake salé because it has an accent on the E, but if there's no accent, it means dirty. So yes. you have to be careful if you're visiting France and you see a cake salé in a window and you want to order it, don't order the dirty cake, order the save <laughs> cake. The salé, not but the sad you, cake. <laughs> you will get a very, very different reaction, 100%. I was buying olives when I moved to Paris. The woman was trying to speak English to me and she's like, do you want some brains with that? And I was like, brains? <laughs> what? And she was saying brine. <laughs> oh, that's, yes, exactly. No, there are there are a whole whole number of mispronunciations we won't get into here, but can lead to very naughty things. So before we hit the Q and A, I just want to. It's hard to show the pictures and how a charming and adorable this book is. Everybody wants photos in books, but you know what? Um, the pictures in this book, the drawings, are so much more evocative of France than a picture in my opinion. And that's what makes the book um, just utterly charming. And this is the Galette de Roi. And they're just beautiful pictures. It's a book. It's beautiful, your book. Thank you. I had, I found a great Parisian illustrator and I really wanted it to be illustrated and not photographed because I, you know, these are, these are meant to be classic recipes. They've been around for a long time. They should stick around for a long time. I didn't want people to, to get, um, I didn't want, want it to look old in a couple of years. I wanted it to stay fresh. So, okay, well, we um, love your book. Thank you. Um, and we're going to take some questions and answers. I'm going to go down here and figure out. It's like every time I use Zoom, I have to figure out how to use it. Um, um, and at the end, too, if we don't get to your question, I'm going to do like a speed round. So don't worry. Um, somebody's asking about using low-fat yogurt. Mm-mm. 
Um, and you know what? It's uh, if you think there's there's not a lot of yogurt. There's only one little jar of yogurt in the cake. So I would just go go for the full fat the whole thing yeah. because it, it really does make a difference. Same with, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why so many of these recipes are, they're fantastic with, you know, American Land O'Lakes normal butter. But if you do have French butter, that, that added fat can really add another layer of decadence. Yeah, and it does affect the texture a little bit. So Chris is asking me what the difference between, he's uh, talking about your Gateau Concorde, uh, the Dacquoise cake with meringues. And he's talk, He's asking about the difference between a Gateau uh, on Dacquoise and a Marjolaine. And he's gonna make the Gateau Concorde for Christmas. Oh, you know, I would <laughs> never attempt a Marjolaine at home because it's, it's, you know, that I would definitely leave to a patissier because it's very intricate with many, many more layers. And then you have to do, you know, a, a, a kind of perfect chocolate exterior with I think a, a mirrored ganache glaze. And, um, and it would take, at least it would take me, you know, at least a week of perfecting that. Um, but it is, it is a similar recipe, but, it, but a, but, it, but instead of it being a very kind of fancy thing that takes hours and hours and hours, the, um, the Concorde, which you should absolutely look at in, in the book and in David's um, substack is just really easy. I mean, you're making discs of meringue, you're, you know, you're letting them sit overnight and you're filling them with this fantastic um, ganache mousse, which is incredibly easy to, to put together. So it's, it's just chocolate on chocolate. It's really good, really simple, fantastic. So Judith is asking in your financier recipe, why you heat up the egg whites with almond flour and sugar? Is it a textural thing? And she said, they're delicious. Okay. Can you answer that? Cause you know more about the science than I do. Um, I can't cause I don't heat it up. Um, um, maybe because some people, maybe because the, um, the whites mount higher. I can't say without looking at the recipe. Yeah, no, there's, um, can I, can I offer to get back to you on that? If you, um, okay. if, if whoever it is shoots me a message, I, I will find out. I just, or I just thought they're delicious. They can leave a comment on your Instagram and what your Instagram is. Is my name. <laughs> which is Alexandra Carpenzano. So it's a long one, but I okay. think it's the only one. Okay. Someone, uh, Jessica is asking, you mentioned chestnut as a flavoring. How do you get that flavor into your baking? Is there something, um, is it some like, can you make chestnut cream or is there a better type? Oh, you know, I buy it and, and everybody I know buys it because it is actually, it's, you know, it's a lot of work to make. You need a lot of chestnuts and you need to roast them and you need to peel them and then you need to cook them and puree them. Um, but they, they're sold in tins and they're also sold in, in little tubes. Um, and I think David's partner likes to, likes to actually eat them from the fridge, if I remember from some newsletter at one point, but, um, but they're so, they're so good. And, uh, what I love about the chestnut puree is that you can actually whip it into whipped cream. So you can whip it right into a chantilly and, and you almost get a kind of immediate chestnut mousse. Again, these are great shortcuts because you, um, you suddenly have, uh, a great filling for, could be for a duck was, it could be for a cake, uh, it could be a topping on something, um, you know. It's, it's that chestnut cream is dangerous. Oh um, yeah. It's really good. And it's, it's candy chestnuts that don't make the cut. They're like the, the cast offs um, and they just grind them up. And that's why there's, that's why you, it's hard to make it at home. Um, you just have to, buy, it's one of those things, it's like marshmallow fluff in a way, like, you can make it at home, but you know what? You can also just buy it. <laughs> so. it's, it's one of the things I cannot keep extra of in the house because I really cannot resist it. So I, I or, just, or just not keep, cream. Yeah, I'll keep the cans, but I would, but I won't keep the tubes. The tubes are too dangerous. Okay. So, well, Janet has two questions. I'm going to answer the first one. You're asking where the recipe for no nets are. It's on page 90. Um, they're called honey spice cakes. And Janet also has a question. She's like, what can you use in place of creme fraiche in the Gato weekend? Um, it's great, Janet, you're going through this book very thoroughly. So I hope you're enjoying it. What can you use in the weekend cake with yuzu? Is there a substitute? 
Right. Basically, what you want to do is you always want to find something with an equal percentage of fat. So if you're going to use a yogurt or a sour cream, um, you want to go with that. If you're going to use a buttermilk, for example, you want to make sure that it's whole. Uh, for the for the weekend cake, instead of creme fraiche, you could use sour cream. You will get a little bit more of a tanginess. Um, mm -hmm. You definitely want to use whole sour cream. Um, you could also do a combination of using whole yogurt and maybe add a tablespoon or two of, of heavy cream. Yeah, Just a couple people have mentioned Greek yogurt as a good swap out. Whole Greek yogurt, the, yeah. the full 5% one is great. So Helen's asking if you recommend higher fat butter for cakes. She said um, she likes to use it for shortbreads, um, but what about cake? So there are a couple of recipes in this book that I actually do really suggest um, that you use a full fat butter. For example, the bread and butter cake, which is essentially a cake that celebrates butter. You really want to go all in on the butter for that because it is about that richness of butter. Um, I do like cooking with, with French butter or European butter simply because it does contain less water. Mm -hmm. But I, in order to make sure that this book was really doable and accessible and well-tested for everybody, I, I tested everything with also with Lando Lake's unsalted butter so that it's, it's you know, every, every recipe is meant to work that way. Uh, one thing I do want to say about butter is that when you are browning butter, because you are actually, some of the water is evaporating, uh, you want to add a little bit more. And I, I usually specify exactly how much, but just something to keep in mind because brown butter is so good and it really gives tremendous flavor, that kind of hazelnutty depth. Um, but, but just be aware that particularly if you're using an American butter, which does have, you know, I think it's about 15% water, whereas a French butter has much less, you are going to see more evaporation and you're going to need to add a little bit extra. I have a question, not a question, but a comment. I have, I have these great ideas and I always give them away, but someone should come up with sticks of browned butter that you can buy <laughs> for baking great idea. like the little jars of ghee oh my gosh yeah okay. my other idea was a spray on a uh, tart shell like you take a tart shell and you just spray the, this crust on and bake it oh that is nice too <laughs> so, so <laughs> is like, is someone that? make the you you're in seattle you people from book larder you have all this tech, all the tech. <laughs> exactly but yeah, I'm a big, I am a big fan of French butter, I have to say. And, you know, and it will, you know, it, it does make, it does elevate things a little bit. I have to say, I went to Isigny where they make the bird de Isigny in Normandy. And I'm like, I love your butter. It was so great. And it only comes from like a certain kind of cow. Um, somebody has a great question. Kathleen is asking about what kind of, a, what French pantry, what kind of essentials should people have um, to make most of these gateaux. She said, you know, everyone has flour, sugar, butter, eggs, vanilla, but are there, are there any other essentials that you yeah. like to have in your kitchen? Or Great question. So I think you, you definitely want to have a little bit of almond flour, ideally. Really good chocolate, you know, especially I'm, I'm a total chocolate nut. David has written a book about chocolate. I think that, um, you know, with a chocolate cake recipes, they are, they have very few ingredients. And so the chocolate is really important. It is, it is that major standout flavor. Uh, I would say, you know, I do like to have a little bit of rum in the house um, because I think sometimes it's, it just adds a layer of complexity to wow. things or other liquors can suddenly add another layer of complexity and they can make even a yogurt cake suddenly turn into a real dinner party cake if you if you brush it with a little bit of a say a Grand Marnier soaking syrup. Uh, but they're really, these are, these are basic pantry things. The one other thing I would say is that, uh, again, I tested this with King Arthur all-purpose flour. Um, sometimes I do cake flour. Sometimes I call specifically for cake flour as well. Uh, also tested with King Arthur, but uh, you know, the French tend to bake with an, an all-purpose flour that is a, that skews a little bit closer to cake flour than our all-purpose flour. Um, so it's good to have, it's good to just have some, all, some cake flour in the, in the pantry okay. too. Carol's asking if you can use buckwheat or tefan kijian instead of rye. And I don't know what tefan kijian is. Uh, I, would, I would also need to get back to you on that. I think that the rye is, 
is a very particular flavor to that recipe. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure. It's like saying, can I make rye bread with buckwheat flour? It's like, well, there's a certain flavor to rye. And there's also, I think rye has gluten, whereas um, buckwheat doesn't, because buckwheat's a plant, it's related to rhubarb. It's not like a grain, whereas rye is, I don't know if it's botanically a grain, but it has gluten. So that might not be um, uh, the same. So somebody, a couple of people are asking me about my vanilla source. I just want to say, um, I don't want to, it's not about my vanilla source, but it's a woman named Patricia Rain, R-A-I-N, like the rain. Um, and she, it's called Rain's Choice. And I believe she only wholesales and she she put off, she doesn't want to, she's, she's of a certain age, like I am. And she doesn't do direct sales herself, um, but Rain's Choice and her Mexican vanilla is amazing. I actually... I bought a quart of each of her vanillas when I moved to France 20 years ago. I'm still using them. So I just remember her name. I think we're all going to call her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's great to have known her. Someone says, what's the first recipe they should try from the book? Um, you know, Karen asked that. Hi, Karen. Uh, depends what you're in the mood for, really. I mean, I... You know, if you really want to start with something simple, definitely the yogurt cake. There's also something called a childhood cake, which I love, which is, um, it almost has a little bit of a creamsicle flavor, but if, if creamsicle were a really sophisticated flavor as opposed to an artificial one. Um, and it is super, super simple. Um, so is the pound cake. Uh, I would, I would, you know, look through the book and, and see what appeals. There's, an, unless you're getting into the holiday chapter, there's really nothing super complicated. Even the chapter on, on Genoise is, is not that complicated because those are, those are sponge cakes that are essentially meant to be dry. I think a lot of people make them and they think, oh my God, my cake is dry, but it's never meant to be served alone. It's meant to be really generously um, brushed with a soaking syrup and then filled with something and, you know. So served with ice cream. Yeah, why not? Exactly. So just uh, Janet's asking, where is the recipe for weekend cake? It's on page 27, but weekend cake refers to any, as we mentioned, any of the pound cakes or cat cat. So you call it weekend cake on page 27, and that's after the 52 variations of flavors. <laughs> and you mentioned your husband, who's an editor. Um, He's a writer, writer. And publisher, yeah. Well, all writers are editors. <laughs> yes, yeah, um, You said he tested all the rest. Did he make 52 pound cakes? You know, I would say probably over the course of our marriage, he's, oh, he hasn't tested them. I tested them on him. He's definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I did. I did that. Um, but yeah, I made a lot of cake. You know, this was originally going to be a small book, and uh, and it kept. You know, it got bigger and bigger and book bigger. Partly because I realized, you know, there hasn't been a book about yeah home cakes. I got to do this. And also, I think you had meant you had written to me a couple of years ago, and you're like, I'm doing a book on French home baking, and I said, Well, that's two recipes. <laughs> Um, and you actually, it's, it's actually not, um, my friends are not bakers, but, um, they do make like one of my friends makes these amazing meals, but I was shocked at how great your book is in a good way, not shocked, like in a bad way. Um, somebody's asking the difference between an apple cake and a bordeaux cake or tart. Do you know that? Um, well, yes. Cause one, I mean, one is a, one is a cake, but the, but the bordeaux, I think is, is, uh, is almost has another name too, which is kind of like an invisible cake. It has very little batter, if I'm not mistaken, um, compared to the amount of apples in it. What do you, can you remind me? Um, I don't know, because I'm looking at questions. I'm letting okay. you answer. Okay. <laughs> um, but from what, I, from what I remember, it is actually, it is a tart. Okay. I thought that um, it might have almond, almond flour in it, but... I'm on, I'm reading like, I'm not good at multitask. I'm used to be better at multitasking. Oh, no, 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 you're doing a great job. Okay. Someone's asking if there's a French, great French baking show and there is, I don't know what it's called, but I've seen it on TV, but you have to, the, a lot of these shows are like four hours in France because they don't, it's not like the same, like one hour, you know, with 20 minutes of commercials. Um, so there is, you just have to find it. And they're not, it's, they're not, they try to copy the American or the British ones. It doesn't work as well to me, but. Um, well, somebody gave us the answer to that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. 
Favorite fall recipe in the book? Oh, you know, I do really, really love the, um, the apple, the two, well, there are two apple cakes in particular. One has a lot of calvados in it and the other one has uh, rum soaked raisins and is delicious and super easy and is kind of that classic uh, French apple cake that I think is heavenly. And, um, you know, and then I, I've actually been playing around. So the French are, are um, I've kind of discovered maple syrup recently. Um, I found, and uh, there was, I had a, I had a, one or two things with not maple syrup, but kind of maple sugar. So mm -hmm. you can definitely, you can substitute maple uh, sugar for things. You can also use maple syrup instead of sugar or honey when making a soaking syrup, which is interesting. Uh, you can take the pain de piece, for example, and even use a kind of, uh, you know, what the same spices you might for a pumpkin pie and do something like that if you wanted to. So these are, these are all pretty adaptable that way, but I do, I do really love those apple cakes. Okay, somebody's asking if you can keep, you should keep your vanilla in the fridge. And he's, he or she said they, or they have said that um, they, um, they've had it go, go off, which I've never had happen. I, I never keep mine in the fridge. I don't either. I think I use mine, I use so much, I bake so much that I probably go through it quickly enough that I've never had that happen either. Okay, somebody mentioned, Janet mentioned she made a yogurt cake marble with chocolate flavoring. Is this common in France? The French marbled. do love marbled cakes, 100%. Yeah. Uh, would you agree? Yes, Gâteau Marble. There's actually a place on, there's a Japanese bakery called Aki, and they do this marbled bread with, you know, with matcha and I think red bean paste, and it's real, it's like a brioche. It's really good. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Um, and I went there the other day and they didn't have it. I was like, I hope you're not, I hope you're going to make it again. Someone wants to, Melissa went, this is the last question um, we have time for, but Melissa's asking about yogurt. She said, There's a lot of yogurts in France and a lot in America um, with seemingly little overlap. She said, what should she look for um, if she wants to make a French yogurt cake in the U.S.? Um, so I... I actually, in New York, I will get Ronnie Brook, and I don't know if that is on the West Coast, but um, but I will look for usually a yogurt that says cream line and is whole and plain. Um, I actually don't like cooking with a flavored yogurt. I prefer to have control over what's added. Um, but, uh, and there are actually, French yogurt is sold. Um, you know, you, you do see it sometimes in those little cups, but really, you know, if you use a Greek, a whole Greek yogurt, or you use a cream line or just a whole yogurt, a whole full fat yogurt, uh, you should be absolutely fine. Yeah, Kristen is saying Strauss yogurt on the West Coast works well. I actually find the, the plain yogurt in America very acidic. Um, Cause mm -hmm. I, I don't know why French yogurt seems smoother to me. Um, I like both, but mm -hmm. it tastes really acidic to me. And I don't know if that's just my imagination or not. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I think that might be why I like the ones that say cream line. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Carmen, last question. What was the first cake you've ever baked and still do now? Oh, oh, you know that. <laughs> you were little. You're telling us when you were little. Um, so the first cake, okay, the first dessert that I remember making was Julia Child's chocolate mousse with my mother. Which um, is a great recipe. Which is a great recipe. Uh, so that is that that is that first recipe. And then um, being a chocolate nut, I did make a literally a chocolate nut. I did make a chocolate nut cake one day for my father when my mother was out of town and it was so incredibly good. And uh, and I just I, I don't think I had enough almonds. So I added lots of different kinds of nuts and somehow it worked and I didn't write down the recipe, but it was fantastic. Well, the first dessert I made was a chocolate souffle. I was, I think, like 15 years old and my parents had left me alone. They went out and then I was too old for a babysitter. And I took my mother's settlement cookbook off the shelf. And I saw oh, chocolate, we have, there's chocolate in the pantry. And I, and I made a chocolate souffle in a Pyrex measuring cup because of course we didn't have a souffle dish. Um, but I looked at the recipe recently when I was looking at my old cookbooks and it's so like nowadays it wouldn't cut it as a recipe because it was so vague. It was like one square of chocolate, like 
what is that? I don't even know <laughs> what that means. That's but um, it was great to talk to you. Um, you have a website. It's Alexan Ale Alexandra Crapanzano.com, which is easy to remember because it's your name. And you're also on Instagram. So people uh, feel free to follow Alexandra. Um, and if you like her book, make desserts from it and put them on Instagram and tag her. Um, I made the Madeleines the other day and I have a few, I took them out. I had a bunch of bookmarks in here, um, but, oh, actually I have a, there's a whole bunch more. Um, <laughs> I don't usually bookmark books so heavily as I did this one. It's a great book. And if you want a copy, you can get one from Book Larder. Um, there's a link they put up to get one. You can get a signed copy. And I love signed books. Um, but thank you so much for joining uh, me today. I was really, I'm more than happy to talk to you. It made me um, happy to talk to you. Cake is always one of my favorite subjects and French cakes are even better. And you've made them so accessible. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, David. Thank you, Book Larder. And, and thank you, everybody who listened. And if you have other questions, honestly, do, don't hesitate at all to, uh, to message me and I will try and answer. Oh, boy. I've got questions, <laughs> but I, want to take no nets. I think no nets are going to be next. So uh, okay. thank you so much. And thank you to Book Larder for inviting me to, to join this. I love Book Larder. And I love oh, my friends. gosh. Thank you, both of you, for joining us. This has been such a wonderful conversation. And of course, huge thank you to everyone tuning in as well. Alexandra, congratulations on a really, really wonderful book. We've all been baking from it and enjoying a lot, it quite a lot. So um, thank you so much to everyone. And have a wonderful night for you two and day for everyone over here in the States. <laughs> we'll see okay. you soon. OK, bye. Bye.